embark on a journey through space with a group of human survivors seeking refuge from their robotic enemies. This TV series, filled with action and adventure, captivates viewers with its gripping storyline and memorable characters. But hold on tight because there are many surprising, amusing, and emotional facts about this show that you'll want to know. So, keep watching. Before we dive into those fascinating details, let me ask you a couple of questions. First, have you ever been inspired or deeply affected by this show? Share your personal story with us in the comments below. And second, who is your favorite actor in this series? Let us know in the comments as well. We'd love to hear your memories or personal experiences related to the series, so don't hesitate to share below. Now get ready to uncover some funny, shocking, and sad facts about this show. Stay tuned. In the world of science fiction TV shows, there's a classic from way back in 1978 that still holds up today. As someone who loves this type of show, I've seen a bunch, but this one really stands out for me. It's got a story that keeps going from episode to episode, which wasn't so common back then. The characters are really likable, even if the special effects aren't as fancy as what we're used to now. What makes this show special is how it talks about big ideas like society and politics, even if it doesn't always get it right. Right from the start, you can feel the tension building up, and it's pretty exciting. It's like this show knew what was up before anyone else did, and it's got a lot of heart which is missing in newer versions. Now, let's talk about the characters. There's a bunch of them, and some of the actors are really good. But one person who really stands out is Jane Seymour. She plays her part perfectly, and it shows how well they picked the actors and wrote their characters. Now, let's switch gears a bit and talk about what this show is all about. It takes ideas from ancient Egyptian stories and Greek myths and puts them into a story that feels familiar but also new. It's kind of like Star Wars in that it's clear who the good guys and bad guys are. This makes it easy for everyone to follow along and enjoy. When you compare it to newer versions like the one from 2004 with all the cool effects, you can see a change in how things are done. The effects might be better, but the characters feel more real, more like regular people. Some might say it's because the world is more complicated now, with good and bad mixed together. But for those of us who love the simpler times, the original show is still the best. So, in the end, Battlestar Galactica is still a top-notch sci-fi show, even though it's been around for a while. Its ongoing story, great characters, and big ideas make it stand out. Whether you're a fan from way back or just getting into it, there's something here for everyone. Len A. Larson, the creator of the 1978 TV series, is a Capricorn, which may explain the prevalence of humans from the Caprica colony in the series. Edward Sadel Jr., a 15-year-old fan, tragically committed suicide in August 1979 due to the cancellation of the show, writing a letter to ABC pleading for its continuation. Sadly, Galactica 1980 premiered five months after his death. Originally, Terry Carter was set to portray Viper pilot Lieutenant Boomer, but injured himself while roller skating. Larson then offered him the role of Colonel Ty, breaking the racial cliché of the time by having two major recurring black characters. This was a departure from Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope, which faced criticism for its all-Caucasian principal cast. Instead, the series featured a diverse cast, with Ty serving as the executive officer of the fleet, second only to Commander Adama himself. In a Blu-ray audio commentary, Richard Hatch revealed his crushes on Sarah Rush and Lorette Spang. Interestingly, he never shared face-to-face -face scenes with Rush. All their dialogue was conducted over communications channels. Hatch, Dirk Benedict, Lorne Green, Herbert Jefferson Jr., and Terry Carter stand out as the only actors appearing in every episode. Additionally, John Colicos, known for his role as Kor on Star Trek, portrayed the nefarious Count Balter in this series. In the 1978 series, there were some intriguing connections to Star Trek. John Colicos, a regular, and Arlene Martle, a guest star, had appeared in Star Trek as well. Martle portrayed Spock's bride, Teepring, while Colicos played the Klingon Commander Corps. The Cylons, the antagonistic force in the series, were led by an imperious leader. The term imperious was chosen deliberately to avoid evoking strong associations with Star Wars. Patrick Mackney provided the voice for the imperious leader, giving an unintended but fitting reference for the Cylon leader. Noah Hathaway, who was part of the cast, confessed in an interview that he had a crush on Jane Seymour, who played his on-screen mother. After the initial miniseries aired, the production of the series took a different turn. Two episodes, known as Gun on Ice Planet Zero, and its sequel, were shot immediately after the first movie. Originally intended as part of a planned trilogy, these episodes were meant to follow a different storyline. However, due to network decisions, the series format changed, 
leading to a shift in production plans. Consequently, some cast members were not present during the filming of these episodes as their characters were not initially intended to continue beyond the first movie. Richard Hatch, a prominent figure in the series, took on multiple roles behind the scenes. He directed, wrote, and starred in a fan film titled The Second Coming, where he brought together surviving cast members. Despite working with limited resources, the film aimed to revive interest in the series. Utilizing volunteer CG animators recruited online, the production faced challenges in maintaining consistent quality due to varying skill levels among contributors. Maren Jensen, known for her role in the series, had a diverse background before her acting career. Prior to her appearance on the show, she was a successful fashion model. Outside of acting, she pursued interest in music, playing the piano and roller skating in her free time. In Galactica 1980, Lauren Green and Herbert Jefferson Jr. returned, while Kent McCord replaced Noah Hathaway as Captain Troy and Dirk Benedict reappeared as Starbuck. The series was a rewrite of Glenn A. Larson's Pilot Adams arc, inspired by Mormon writings and developed with guidance from Gene L. Kuhn, a successful Star Trek showrunner. Commander Adama, like Bonanza's Ben Cartwright, was a widower with three children. Zack was killed by Cylons, and Adama's wife Illa died in an attack. Lorne Green played Ben Cartwright. Lorne Green, the only actor in every episode of both the series and its follow-up, played a crucial role in maintaining the show's consistency. The story centered around the idea of another human civilization beyond Earth, challenging common thoughts about where humans come from. In the episode The Hand of God, there was a hint that the story took place after the Apollo 11 mission, adding an interesting twist to the historical background. These elements came together to create a thought-provoking exploration of where humanity fits in the universe. In the late 1960s, Glenn A. Larson conceived a series titled Adam's Ark, which later became Battlestar Galactica. It depicted human survivors seeking a new home after Earth's destruction. In one episode, second unit shots featured doubles of key characters walking among ruins in Egypt. The broadcast of the Camp David Accords interrupted the series' premiere, symbolizing a real-world link to Egypt's history. Despite high expenses, ABC canceled the series. NBC and CBS showed interest but didn't acquire it. The remake aired on Sci-Fi, a Comcast-owned channel. The creators were free to make up the fleet that goes with Galactica. Ken Swenson designed the livery ship with a lot of attention to detail. He made it from scratch to look like film cans, giving a nod to the start of storytelling in the galaxy. The ship wasn't just a vessel, it symbolized hope and strength, carrying the dreams of a civilization looking for safety. Don Johnson's southern accent was smooth and charming like molasses on a warm night. This led to Dirk Benedict getting the role of Lieutenant Starbuck. Benedict brought the character to life with his drawl and charming smirk, embodying the rebellious spirit of a pilot navigating through space. Lieutenant Starbuck became a quick favorite among fans across the galaxy. In the original series, Boxy's real name wasn't revealed, leaving fans guessing for a long time. But in the sequel, his identity was finally disclosed as Troy, played by Kent McCord. McCord, who showed his talent and versatility in every scene, added a new layer to the character. He filled Troy with determination and courage fitting for his family's history. It's interesting to note that McCord was once considered for the role of Apollo, showing how casting decisions and fate connect actors and characters in the cosmic drama of storytelling. In the exciting world of galactic adventures, these stories behind the scenes make the lore of Battlestar Galactica richer. Whether you're a longtime fan or a new one, every detail from ship designs to casting choices contributes to the history of this series. It reminds us of the powerful imagination and limitless possibilities found among the stars. In the colonial calendar system, a year is referred to as a Jahren, which is an anglicized spelling of the German word for year Jahren. Seconds are called microns, although this term technically denotes a microscopic unit of length, not time. The 125-minute feature film released in theaters was an edited version of the 148-minute first episode Saga of a Star World. Much of Glenn A. Larson's Mormon religion influences the series. For instance, there's the Quorum of the Twelve, also known as the Council of the Twelve, akin to the Mormon ruling body under their prophet. The term sealing is used for marriage, reminiscent of a Mormon temple wedding, and the notion of sealings being for all the eternities mirrors Mormon celestial marriages being for time and eternity. The moral lessons of each episode reflect Mormon design. These religious references and influences imbue the series with depth and cultural resonance, shaping its narrative and moral compass.
In certain episodes of the series, certain cast members are credited, but not shown due to budget and post-production constraints. He based his character Lieutenant Starbuck on James Garner's Maverick and criticized her character, referring to her as Stardom. Along with his father, he appeared in the show and also acted together in the film Troll. In the 1978 TV series, Jane Seymour was initially set to star in a series of television movies, but opted out when ABC changed plans to make it a weekly show. Consequently, her character Serena was written off. In some European broadcasts, episodes like Saga of a Star World and The Living Legend were omitted due to theatrical releases of related films. Despite this, Fire in Space still aired. Cassiopeia, originally intended to appear only in the pilot, became a regular character due to the series format change and the need for more female roles. Her role was adjusted, transitioning from a socialator to a med tech in the second episode. Season 2 of the series never made it to filming due to its cancellation. Several scripts, including The Beta Pirates, Crossfire, Fire in Space, The Mutiny, I Have Seen Earth, and Two for Twilly were penned but never brought to life. Dirk Benedict, known for his role in the series, once shared a snapshot with actress Caddy Sackhoff at a coffee shop, dubbing it Starbuck with Starbuck at Starbucks. This move followed Benedict's public criticism of the series reboot, particularly the reimagining of Starbuck as a woman. Evie, the chimpanzee belonging to exotic animal trainer Ralph Helfer, portrayed the robot dog Muffet. These tidbits offer insights into the series' behind-the-scenes dynamics and the interactions among its cast and crew. John Colicos, known for his role in the 1978 TV series, became synonymous with Balter, earning him the part of Miko's Cassidine in General Hospital's Ice Princess story arc in 1981. Audiences in his native Toronto applauded him after theater performances, chanting Balter Lives. In another sci-fi stint, Calico's portrayed Kor in Star Trek Errand of Mercy, introducing the Klingons, reprising the role in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Props from this series found new life in Buck Rogers in the 25th century, produced by Glenn A. Larson, who also helmed the 1978 show. Muffet 2, Boxy's robotic Daggett, featured a unique approach. A trained chimpanzee inhabited the Daggett drone costume, with three different chimps taking turns during the series. These behind-the-scenes glimpses add layers to the 1978 TV series, showcasing the interconnectedness of the sci-fi entertainment landscape. In Spanish-speaking countries, the series is known as Galactica Astronave de Combate, and in Germany, it is called Kampstern Galactica. The classic sound of the Cylons was later incorporated into Kit and Knight Rider. The sound of a viper, when it was launched from the Galactica, was also incorporated into Kit. It sounded when Michael Knight activated the turbo boost to make the car jump. The silent centurions all had to be over six feet tall to make them more intimidating, so Glenn A. Larson hired a team of out-of-work basketball players. In the series, John Colicos wore a hairpiece for most episodes, with no clear explanation given for this change in appearance. Additionally, his character's initial green outfit remains unexplained after its first appearance. Us Air Force pilots began calling the F-16 Fighting Falcon the Viper as a nod to Battlestar Galactica. Despite similarities between the F-16 and the Colonial Viper, the latter wasn't based on any real-world fighter aircraft. Character names in Battlestar Galactica draw from Greek mythology, such as Apollo and Athena. Starbuck and Boomer come from Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Adama's name is a reworking of Adam, fitting for Lauren Green's Jewish heritage. Long before the iconic Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope hit the screens, Glenn A. Larson had Battlestar Galactica in the pipeline. However, he found himself entangled in a legal battle when 20th Century Fox and George Lucas filed a lawsuit against him, claiming the series bore too much resemblance to Star Wars. Breaking new ground in television production, Battlestar Galactica became the first weekly TV series with a budget exceeding $1 million per episode. Unfortunately, a significant portion of this hefty sum was allocated to visual effects, leading to frequent and noticeable reuse of footage throughout the series. Originally intended as a series of made-for-television movies, Larson had envisioned a different production trajectory. The inclusion of Lorne Green in the cast earned the series an unexpected nickname from critics Battlestar Ponderosa. This humorous moniker drew attention to the presence of Green, known for his role in the classic TV series Bonanza. These challenges and quirks in the production process added layers of complexity to the series, offering viewers a unique perspective on the behind, the scene's dynamics that influenced its development. In the series, the exact size of colonial battle stars like the Galactica and Cylon-based stars wasn't clearly explained. 
A scale measurement comparison revealed that each battle star, including the Galactica, was 4 150 feet long with flight bays measuring 19077 feet in length. This made them larger than Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. They could carry more than the listed 150 fighters, with over 200 pilots mentioned in some instances. Silent base stars, on the other hand, were 5 800 feet wide and could carry more than their listed contingent of 300 fighters. Richard Hatch is the only actor to appear in both versions of Battlestar Galactica. Lieutenant Starbuck was ranked 21 in TV Guide's list of the 25 greatest sci-fi legends. The helmets worn by colonial warriors took inspiration from the headdresses of ancient Egyptian pharaohs. Additionally, they featured a bird motif as a subtle nod to Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, affectionately nicknamed the Great Bird of the Galaxy by the cast and crew. The insignia pins seen on the uniform jackets and shirt collars resembled the officer branch of service insignia pin for the U.S. Army's G2, or Military Intelligence, section worn inverted. The gold tone pins matched the tan and brown uniforms of colonial warriors, while nickel-plated silver tone pins were used for the blue uniforms worn by Corps Command Bridge officers, though not officially Army Regulation Insignium. The controls on the Galacticus Bridge were largely standard electronic laboratory equipment manufactured by Tektronix Inc. These components were designed in a mainframe style resembling 19-inch wide racks holding various test equipment such as multimeters, power supplies, and signal generators. These racks were arranged tier after tier across the bridge, functioning as control panels. Tektronix received credit in the closing credits for providing test and display equipment. In the TV series, Sheba never used her laser pistol. However, Dirk Benedict, who played Templeton Face Peck in the A-Team, had a surprising run-in with a Cylon while visiting Universal Studios. It was like a scene from a sci-fi show. Fans started buzzing about possible crossovers between the two famous shows. Interestingly, there was a legal clash between George Lucas and 20th Century Fox, claiming that the show was too similar to Lucas's Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope. Fans on both sides argued passionately during the legal battle. Despite trying to tweak the pilot to ride on Star Wars success, and even sharing special effects teams, the lawsuit dragged on until 1980 when it was finally dropped. The legal drama and fan excitement added an unexpected twist to the early days of the show, showing how creativity, inspiration, and ownership rights collide in the entertainment industry. The repercussions of these events are still felt in the history of sci-fi TV. Frank Frazetta, a renowned fantasy artist, crafted four promotional paintings for the TV series. These artworks graced the pages of TV Guide and various magazines. One of Frazetta's pieces even adorned the cover of the Berkeley novelization Battlestar Galactica to the Cylon Death Machine, authored by Glenn A. Larson and Robert Thurston in early 1979. The series introduced a unique time measurement system for humans. A micron equated to a second, while a centon represented a minute. Beyond that, a center, sectin, sector, and yarn denoted hour, week, month, and year, respectively. Richard Hatch, the sole actor to feature in both versions of the series, took on a different role in the latter. While not reprising his original character, Apollo, he portrayed Tom Zarek in the later series. Zarek, unlike Apollo, was a less sympathetic character. In 1978, a popular series aired on ABC. When Mork and Mindy ended, ABC tried to fill its slot with a revamped version of the series on Sundays, but it didn't work out as planned. This led ABC to reconsider canceling the series, resulting in the development of a new show, Galactica 1980. Lorne Green, known for his role in the series, was meant to appear in a flashback scene for a new Battlestar Galactica series, but it didn't happen. Richard Hatch, another key figure, wrote books based on the original series in 2000. These developments added depth to the legacy of the show. The synthesized robotic sounding voices of the Cylon Centurions were done by Michael Santiago using the EMS Vocoder 2000. This device has become extremely difficult to find and is very expensive. It has become even more expensive since the turn of the millennium than it was in the 1970s. When John Dixtra was hired to work on the series, it was not yet planned as a weekly series, but rather a three-part miniseries of made-for-television movies. In order to pay him a higher salary than he would have made as an optical effects supervisor, Glenn A. Larson made Dijkstra a line producer. Unfortunately, Dijkstra's working relationship with Larson became strained, partly due to the decision to release the first television movie in theaters, which Dijkstra felt was not a proper way to showcase his effects work. 
When ABC decided to buy the series, Dijkstra chose not to stay, and so his producer credit only appeared on Saga of a Star World and the two-part gun on Ice Planet Zero, which were the first to be shot before the switch to a regular series format. In the opening credits, the words that start life here began out there were spoken by Patrick Mackney, who provided the voice of the Imperious Leader. In a surprising twist, despite its initial popularity, the 1978 TV series faced cancellation after just one season. The sudden end left fans and creators disappointed by the premature end of the storyline. Despite this setback, the show remains a cult classic, with a devoted fan base that continues to analyze its themes, characters, and influence on the science fiction genre. The series' unexpected ending has sparked debate among fans, with many expressing disappointment at the unresolved plotlines and unanswered questions. The cancellation of the show serves as a reminder of the unpredictable nature of the television industry and the challenges faced by creators in keeping their shows on the air. Despite its brief run, the series has left a lasting impact, shaping future science fiction television and continuing to engage audiences decades later. Television history holds moments of unexpected change. In 1978, a popular TV series faced a surprising turn that shocked its fans. Richard Hatch, who played Captain Apollo, disagreed with the show's direction and left due to creative differences. This departure left a hole in the series, altering its storyline and affecting how fans connected with it. The sudden exit of such a central character reminded viewers of the uncertainties that can happen behind the scenes of their favorite shows. Television productions often encounter challenges where decisions can lead to unexpected outcomes. Despite Hatch's departure, the series continued adapting to the changes and continuing to captivate its audience. The departure of Richard Hatch from the 1978 TV series changed its course and added an element of unpredictability that resonated with fans. It shows how television shows can evolve unexpectedly, both in their storytelling and behind the scenes, creating drama on and off the screen. In one of the episodes, a shocking tragedy struck the crew when a beloved member met an unexpected demise. The loss deeply affected the others and left viewers in shock. Throughout the series, it explores big ideas like survival, right and wrong, and what happens during wars. The characters face lots of tough stuff as they travel through space, always running from their enemies. The show also looks at how the crew members get along, showing their struggles when they succeed, and how they support each other during all the craziness. Despite being canceled at first, the old TV series has lots of fans now and has had a big impact on science fiction TV. In 1978, a sci-fi TV series captured the hearts of viewers with its gripping tale of survival and resilience. However, its sudden cancellation left fans yearning for more, as the storyline remained unresolved. Following a group of humans fleeing from a relentless robotic race, the show centered around their journey aboard a battleship where they faced internal conflicts and external threats. Led by a commanding figure, the survivors navigated through moral dilemmas and challenges, each character contributing their own strengths and vulnerabilities to the narrative. Despite its short run, the TV series made a lasting impression on the world of science fiction television, influencing future shows and gathering a dedicated following. Its themes of survival, morality, and human perseverance continue to captivate audiences, even today. 